Truth Espresso, episode 247. Face it, we all would rather sleep in this morning. <sighs> That's why God gave us espresso, to kickstart our zombified corpses into hyperdrive. <laughs> and now, giving your mind and soul the morning shot of truth it craves. <sighs> this is Truth Espresso with Daniel Minnick. Why, hello there, friends, family, foes, and lurkers alike. This is your host, Daniel Minnick, and I have with me my sweet, beautiful wife and co-host, Chelsea, and we are continuing our little series on Supreme Court gesturing, looking at the slate of Supreme Court rulings that happened at the end of June 2023, and this one is definitely a doozy and no less important than the other two. In fact, when it comes to Christians, being able to practice their faith and say what they mean or say what they believe, this case really gets to the heart of it. So, sweetheart, ready to talk more about some Supreme Court gesturing? Yes. So the case that we're going to look at, the ruling thereof, is 303 Creative versus Alanis. This case, the topic was whether a web designer is required to design a website for a so-called gay wedding against her religious convictions as a matter of free speech. So this case was testing the conflict between political considerations of so-called anti-discrimination with the First Amendment. So can one override the other? And in what cases? And when they clash, what wins? So as we kind of charge into this topic of just free speech and truth and how our words, what we say is so important, a good verse to remind ourselves of this principle comes from Zechariah 8.16, where it says, These are the things that ye shall do. Speak ye every man the truth to his neighbor. Execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gate. That verse definitely demonstrates that speaking truth, so the freedom to speak truth, is important, and it's something that God commands. And so any government that would prohibit freedom of speech, particularly the freedom of Christians to speak their mind, to speak the truth of God's word in society, to be able to practice and live out their faith— is an illegitimate government. So that would violate Zechariah 8.16 because we are commanded by God to speak the truth to our neighbor. So I was thinking maybe we could read, since it's just kind of short, what the First Amendment is. Oh yeah, that sounds like a good idea. (laughs) (laughs) So the First Amendment states that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. And here we see in this case that we're going to look into a little further is that this case surrounds the First Amendment and what the First Amendment is trying to uphold as far as our freedom to be able to speak and to speak in relation to our personal religious beliefs and that it's okay that those two coincide. We don't have to be forced by government, which goes against the First Amendment here, that we should not be forced to have to speak certain things. I like the fact that the First Amendment delineates several rights together in one amendment because I think that they're all related. Because the Congress shall write no law respecting an establishment of religion, recognizing that the states at this time all had different sects of Christianity, different state churches, or rather community churches, Some states were the Congregationalists, as we think about the revival series that we're going through. Some states had like more Quakers than others. Maryland eventually became a state that was had a lot of 
Catholic migrants. Since the states were going to federate under a constitution, the federal government recognized that the federal Congress had no right to write laws that would interfere with the state's sovereignty in recognizing their own religious liberties and expressions. So, It's important to recognize that the amendments there were restrictions on what the federal government can do as it reflected a compact among the states. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, that state governments can trample on rights, but what the Constitution and the Bill of Rights were recognizing that these were already rights that the people and the states had. So to say Congress shall write no law prohibiting the free exercise thereof, this is not the government granting a right. This is saying the Congress, the federal Congress, cannot inhibit on this right right that already intrinsically exists. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes people don't recognize what the purposes of the amendments were. They were to say the federal government cannot trample on already existing natural God-given rights. Or abridging the freedom of speech. It's not saying the federal government divinely grants you the right to freedom of speech and can take it away at some point as they determine is necessary. No, abridging the freedom of speech, it meant you already naturally, given by God, have this freedom and Congress has no right to abridge that. And I like how the First Amendment groups all these amendments together like Naturally, the freedom of religion, the freedom not to have it prohibited, it's free exercise, also the freedom of speech and the press, you know, like you can say something, you can write something, or the freedom to assemble, you know, like like like-minded people can get together, they can organize, they can meet together, that's related to speech and press and exercising religion and then also to petition the government for redress of grievances is also lumped in there together to say hey government we think you're interfering with something we have the freedom given by god to tell you stop it (laughs) (laughs) i think this is an exercise of making really the entire first amendment put to the test here So, the case of 303 Creative versus Elenus was ruled in favor of 303 Creative. It was a 6-3 ruling again, so this was the conservative majority versus the liberal minority. And so, what was this case about? 303 Creative LLC was a one-person company, basically created by Lori Smith, a Colorado resident who offers graphic design services for anyone. Of course, as long as the service itself is neutral to her beliefs, because she is a Christian, and so she like, hey, I'll design a logo for your business, I'll design graphics, whatever you want, as long as it's not what she would consider wicked or un biblical. It's reasonable for some people not to want to have to design graphics showing a logo or a graphic showing someone getting brutally murdered. Who would object to that? But then also, you know, if you're a Christian, you believe if you are biblical Christian, you would believe that marriage actually has a specific meaning because God created them male and female and everywhere in the Bible that you have marriage, it is always a man and a woman. That's what the word means. That the union of man and woman to be husband and wife and ultimately potentially to have children, to start a family, the union of them and related ceremony, according to the Bible, means a certain thing. A man and a woman. One man and one woman. And so naturally, since she's a Christian, she decided that she wanted to grow her graphic design services to do website designs. And she also wanted to be able to do wedding websites, but knowing that when you get to weddings, you get to current secular politics that tries to redefine terms, 
And so they want to claim that, well, two men or two women can get married. And so if you're going to offer services to design wedding websites, that you have to be open to offering them to unions that this woman or biblical Christianity would not recognize. So kind of what the story behind this whole lawsuit is, on September 20th of 2016, the Alliance Defending Freedom helped Lori Smith file a lawsuit kind of as a preemptive way to make sure she was going to be protected for offering services. And we have previous cases, which we'll talk a little bit more later on, about people in Colorado being harassed for not providing wedding cakes specifically designed for homosexuals. And Lori was like, I don't want to go through that. So let's go ahead and see if we can establish some groundwork here and make sure her business is protected. And so, of course, it took a while to have things come through. And then the day after she filed the case, then a person pretending to be a homosexual is what they're guessing. He said that his name was Stuart and that he wanted to have a website designed for his upcoming same-sex wedding. And a few years later, a magazine called The New Republic got a hold of this information and reached out to this person, Stuart, and asked about his inquiry and like what his response was wanting this website. And this man said that he had never submitted anything requesting that. So then The New Republic was like, oh, we have something against, you know, Lori and her case here. So they kind of submitted this article and other news media places, unfortunately, went along with it too. And they were in some ways smearing. I like the word that the Alliance Defending Freedom used. That it was a smear against this case to try and get people to think, oh, they made up this whole gay wedding request for designing a website this person, we contacted him and he wasn't even a client and he denied everything. But interestingly enough, the guy that called was the day after they had filed the lawsuit. So it doesn't even make sense that they would try to make something up like that if they had already filed the lawsuit. So it was just kind of interesting that they found something that they could kind of twist and make it seem like, you know, you know, this whole case is horrific and they're making up stuff to try and get a case. And so anyways, the Alliance Defending Freedom did an amazing job of just speaking the truth and presenting what really did happen and just how that kind of speech is what they're trying to fight for that you have the freedom to speak truth. And even if other people may not agree with you, they have that same freedom to speak too. And that is how you can get to truth if you keep talking and keep learning and having that ability to communicate, even if it is opposing views. I think that that's where you can come to know truth as well. I think the freedom of speech, even of speech we don't like, I think that freedom is a freedom from God that ultimately leads to truth prevailing anyway. Because I think when it comes to what you might call the marketplace of ideas, truth prevails over falsehood when there's equal freedom allowed. So, Ms. Smith sought a preliminary injunction, as you mentioned, so we are preventing the state of Colorado. She was concerned that the Colorado Anti-Discrimination Act would force her to design websites against her biblical conditions, so she actively sought a preliminary injunction that would make sure that she was protected. So, it's kind of like, hey, if I'm going to step into the water, I want to make sure the water's not hostile to me. You know, I don't want to just jump into it. It and then be forced to jump out. I've got to make sure the water's fine. So on June 30th, 2023, the case was determined in favor of 303 Creative or Ms. Lori Smith. So the case was basically demonstrating that the First Amendment guarantee that not to abridge the freedom of speech 
her case was ultimately a First Amendment case because her web design is her own creative expressions, and so therefore, because she has the freedom of speech, anything that would claim that she would be discriminating, any kind of public accommodation law or anti-discrimination law would not be able to force her to violate her First Amendment liberties. And we'll talk about even some other kind of problems if the other side were to prevail on this. So do you know why they filed the lawsuit back in 2016, (laughs) but it's just now ruled on? Yeah, if I remember from when I was reading... Basically, I think her, well, the preliminary injunction was not granted. First, originally, claiming that she didn't have the standing to sue. Eventually, she went to the Circuit Court of Appeals, and then they ruled, they did say that she did have standing to sue, but that she couldn't be granted the injunction or have it ruled in her favor. And it turned to be a two to one ruling there, saying that the state laws could compel her. But she decided, like, kind of to wait on things. And then when the Masterpiece Cake Shop case was going, then it was kind of like, okay, well, now we got to wait to see how this turns out because this is a similar issue. Mm. So, yeah, her case was, seemed to be kind of started before Masterpiece a little bit, but Masterpiece kind of stretched hers out more as there is a lot of waiting and seeing how things are going to happen before she could proceed with hers. Ever wish you could get together with a friend over coffee each week and talk about God's Word? Me too. Hi, I'm Anthony Russo. I'm the host of Grace and Peace Radio. Grace and Peace Radio is a Christian living blog and podcast dedicated to engaging conversations about applying God's Word to everyday life. I hope you'll join me, Anthony Russo, on Grace and Peace Radio each week at graceandpeaceradio.com or right here on the Christian Podcast Community.org. So, Justice Neil Gorsuch was the one who wrote the ruling opinion And then Justice Sonia Sotomayor wrote the dissenting opinion. And of course, the other two liberal justice joined in an affirming her dissent and the conservative ones joined in on Gorsuch's opinion. So Gorsuch, in the ruling, wrote, held, The First Amendment prohibits Colorado from forcing a website designer to create expressive designs speaking messages with which the designer disagrees. So, naturally, the ruling here to be held is that this is clearly and obviously First Amendment. And, of course, a state cannot interfere with a person's natural God-given First Amendment free speech rights. And this has to do with expression and speech. You can't force someone to convey a message that goes against what they believe. Gorsuch also wrote in the ruling, Generally, too, the government may not compel a person to speak its own preferred messages. So we recognize that so-called public accommodation laws or anti-discrimination laws are the purview of the government. And so it's like now you're having a government telling a citizen what the citizen may say or in what venues the citizen may express their beliefs or even compel them to say something against their own beliefs. So, yeah, governments may not do that. And Gorsuch later on says, Ms. Smith seeks to engage in protected First Amendment speech. Colorado seeks to compel speech she does not wish to provide. As the Tenth Circuit observed, if Ms. Smith offers wedding websites celebrating marriages she endorses, the state intends to compel her to create custom websites celebrating other marriages she does not. So we can see the slippery slope here. When it comes to the secular religion of the government and the state of Colorado and other states and stuff, trying to cram all these different things into what it means to discriminate and protected classes, as they call them, like... Okay, let's add more to it. Eventually they add sexual orientation to it. And then even more recently now, like gender identity and personal identity and other kinds of identity that these are all protected classes and any kind of civil rights laws now apply to just 
personal identity. And so then someone with uh, an identity or an orientation can then compel people to accommodate them specifically because, hey, they're a protected class and therefore you can't discriminate. So I really liked this interview that I was watching that CNN did with the vice president of ADF, or I guess she's actually the president. So General Counsel Kristen Wagner, she did the interview along with Susie Smith. Lori Smith, is it? Yeah, Lori Smith. So during this interview on CNN, the president of ADF was really good about describing like the difference between discrimination and prohibiting free speech because she was giving the example like discrimination would be you can't deny someone a good or service like if they walk into a store and they buy, I'll just give my own example, like they buy a bag of bread, you can't say oh, you appear to be uh, Jewish, so you can't buy the bread. Like, you can't discriminate based on that. But if someone is asking you to write something, create something using speech in any form of speech, written word is speech as well, then that is going against the First Amendment. So I just liked how she kind of clarified that for the guy who's interviewing them on CNN because he was trying to make that kind of very muddy. And he even made the comment that you make everything seem black and white. I think there's a lot of gray area here. (laughs) She's like, um, no, you're trying to complicate things. <laughs> but then they want to make it black and white. Is like, hey, you know, the most important thing are protected classes and nothing can be denied them, including compelling other people to accommodate them, you know, even specifically. Yeah. So let's play a clip of that CNN interview. The court's decision does not do that at all. It reaffirmed a time-honored principle found in our Constitution, which is that the First Amendment follows a golden rule. If we want to protect speech for ourselves, then we need to protect it for others, even those we disagree with. Whether someone feels uncomfortable, they, they certainly can't deny service because they feel uncomfortable. The court's ruling says that non-discrimination laws continue to apply to ensure that people can't be denied services or goods because of a protected characteristic. But it also says that no matter who you are, the government can't force you to say something that you don't believe. And that's a win for everyone. Right. You you make it sound as if these are black and white determinations, though. I think a lot of this is in the gray area. What what exactly is speech? I don't know why so much of this litigation is in a wedding context, but okay, I'll roll with it. So I guess the baker is speaking. I guess the website designer, your client is speaking. Presumably the florist is speaking, the photographer. What about the stagehand? What about the wedding singer? You know, what about all those ancillary businesses that go into, are they all offering speech or aren't they just there doing a job like they would do for any other couple? If they're doing a job and there's not speech involved, then they, they're, the non-discrimination principles apply and the First Amendment does not in the free speech context. And so I think you're overcomplicating it. As you open, the court's decision, the majority decision by Justice Gorsuch is clear. There are clear tests in the law as to when speech is involved. We know when speech is involved. And here we have the written printed word. So there's no question that speech is involved. In, in terms of Justice Sotomayor's dissent, as the majority said she's litigating a case that wasn't even before the court and on entirely different facts so again like you said americans should read the decision and decide for themselves and so justice gorsuch makes a a good point there and yeah the cnn interviewer obviously doesn't understand and conflates two different things and i think the ruling demonstrates that there's a difference and even in the dissent from Sotomayor, it seems like they don't really distinguish between the example of having a general store selling bread and then a customer walks in and then the store can't discriminate forcing an off-the-shelf sale versus a customized service like this in which you're making someone have to express a belief they don't agree with. So some of Sotomayor Sotomayor, her dissension starts off saying, The business argues, and a majority of the court agrees, that because the business offers services that are customized and expressive, 
The free speech clause of the First Amendment shields the business from a generally applicable law that prohibits discrimination in the sale of publicly available goods and services. That is wrong. Profoundly wrong. As I will explain, the law in question targets conduct, not speech, for regulation and the act of discrimination has never constituted protected expression under the First Amendment. Our Constitution contains no right to refuse service to a disfavored group. <laughs> yeah, Blah. it's kind of weird. Like, okay, so in her understanding, what does the First Amendment protect? Like abridging the freedom of speech. Where is the freedom of speech even allowed if anyone in commerce at all can be compelled to say something they don't agree with? It doesn't make sense how she wrote. So she's explaining that the law in question targets conduct mm. and not speech. <laughs> okay, so now we have to behave a certain way and act a certain mm. way that coincides with what the leftists like <laughs> yeah. want because somehow her conduct wasn't appropriate for saying no to <laughs> having this website. I don't know, it just seems so weird because like we're talking about speech and creativity and design stuff and then all of a sudden she is trying to explain it and goes to conduct. <laughs> Unless I'm not understanding that correctly, but sometimes her explanations or her reasoning just seems very convoluted, I guess. I don't even think the Bible distinguishes between conduct and speech. You know, it's related to out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. You know, like let your conduct be always with grace and your speech. You know, it's like speech and conduct are one thing in Scripture. But you can't separate them because then you end up with people like lying, basically, having to put on a front. And we don't want a bunch of zombies in public of people believing believing things about having to suppress it and act completely contrary and opposite to what they believe to satisfy the secular religion of the left. It's interesting that, you know, as I was looking through Sotomayor's dissent, and of course Sotomayor uses examples of public venues such as restaurants and lamenting like hotels with signs saying things like, no blacks, no Muslims, no gays, you know, as her supporting argument. But this is not the same thing, you know, putting a sign that prevents certain people from entering and buying off the shelf goods in a neutral way or being able to spend the night in a hotel without them having to make an issue of something about them to someone offering this general public accommodation service. That's completely different from what's going on with this case here. There's a difference between a store having shelves of generic goods publicly available and having to check, actively check a customer to prevent a sale and a business offering customized services that express the thoughts and beliefs of the provider. There's a huge difference there. One of them involves the First Amendment. The other one doesn't. So let me give you an example. Perhaps a better illustration of this distinction, say what the left might demand here, perhaps a better illustration would be demanding that a Christian bookstore, it's advertised as a Christian bookstore, so you know that when you go in, you know what kind of books you're going to see. But demanding that a Christian bookstore must stock books promoting, not just talk about Wicca, not refuting Wiccan, but promoting Wicca or other occult practices on the shelves, when that's not the purpose of this brand of bookstore. And it would force the owner to advocate for messages against the owner's beliefs. I guess that's the part that kind of frustrates me with this whole debate, even with like Masterpiece Cakes, that it's like there are so many unique and kind of niche places that people can go. There's a website designer that advertises that they do websites or weddings for LGBTQ. <laughs> so if you're identifying as that, wouldn't you go to that specific vendor because you know that they're going to provide you with what you want because you're like identifying identifying with them and if you're going to someone 
who identifies as a Jewish baker or something and you want to practice the kosher way of baking and stuff, then you would go to the Jewish baker. Like to me, that's just common sense. You go to the person where you know that it fits that unique niche that you want or desire. And to me, kind of the amazing thing about the free market is that the free market allows for this individual creativity and that freedom to go and seek out that specific thing that you're looking for. So to me, it's just frustrating that it's kind of like forcing two pieces of a puzzle to go together and they don't. Okay, if it's a Christian baker, then why on earth is a homosexual person keep going and forcing this baker to make something for him? Go to another baker. As I was reading Sotomayor's Descent, there's an example having to do with funeral services. And the example was that they were starting a service, but then once they found out that the spouse, as they called it, was an, of a man, was another man, that they were stopping the service. But yeah, like what about you're having a cake baker or some kind of, you mentioned the Jewish example. What if someone demanded a Jewish or even Muslim chef or baker to make a cake and they had to fry bacon and p- crumble it up and put it as a topping on it? And they demanded them to do that because that was part of their expression. They're wanting to celebrate some kind of bacon day or something, you know, like I know it's an absurd example, but think someone could do that technically and say, well, I am demanding that you express this for me and then force people to violate their religious beliefs. Where do you draw the line? Of course, this secular religion of the left, they would say, well, the line is clearly how the progressive government has defined protected classes. So the guy, again, back to the CNN interview, he said, okay, if a pharmacist is prescribing medications and they refuse to prescribe the birth control pill because that goes against their religious beliefs, his opinion is that that person should never become a pharmacist. This is a law school dream, this case. Lori, a final one for you. Think of the pharmacist called upon to fill a prescription for birth control who has a religious objection to doing so. I would say, hey, you chose to be a pharmacist. And if you have trouble providing this service, maybe this is not a gig for you. What about someone who similarly says, if you want to be a web designer, you got to serve everybody and your religion can't come into it. Okay, with the Jewish baker, that same logic would apply. Like, oh, if that Jewish baker refuses to cook bacon and put it on top of the bread, then why did he even become a baker? Yeah. Like, it's absurd. There's certain things that you do, and that's where, again, our freedom comes from, is being able to have this expression and not having government or law or people coming and forcing you to practice a certain way or do things a certain way. And obviously this goes similar to Masterpiece Cake Shop, you know, of course, also Colorado here. And the dissenters knew that. In fact, the court itself said, quoting from the Tenth Circuit, Colorado has a history of past enforcement against nearly identical conduct, i.e. Masterpiece Cake Shop. So they know that Masterpiece Cake Shop has a similar issue with 303 Creative here. It was somewhat like narrowly ruled in favor of Masterpiece at the time, the first Supreme Court ruling there, but it wasn't really as definitive as this case was. And the ruling in this case was more like it's clearly First Amendment, it's clearly in favor of 303 Creative, whereas when you didn't have the two newer conservative justices, you had Justice Kennedy then in the Masterpiece one, but he retired and Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away. So So during the Trump administration, they added Amy Coney Barrett and the other one (laughs) who's, you know, the the one who is controversial. And, you know, they're trying to claim that he had a bad past and with women and stuff like that. You know, I don't know why his name escapes me, but (laughs) yeah. So those two justices and now you have a more conservative court that ruled in a simpler way, in a more obvious way that, yeah, this is clearly a First Amendment case here. 
Yeah, Brett Kavanaugh, that was the one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mine definitely went blank on that name. <laughs> My name is Andy Olson, and I want to tell you about Echo Zoe Radio. Echo Zoe Radio is a podcast outreach of Echo Zoe Ministries. Every month I find a knowledgeable guest to talk about an important and interesting topic that affects the church today. We carefully balance the discussions of positive, God-glorifying doctrines of Orthodox Christianity from a mostly Reformed point of view with exposés of heresy, false teaching, and poor practice that goes on throughout the church today. You can find us at echozoe.com. That's E-C-H-O-Z-O-E dot com. And unfortunately, we see the effects of even after Jack Phillips of Masterpiece Cake Shop got kind of a narrow victory, he's still getting sued again and again. And basically, the activists want to put him through the ringer and pretty much they want to force him out of business to try to make a statement like, you will not bake cakes in Colorado unless you do what we want. Like Lori Smith for 303 Creative, Jack Phillips said that he doesn't discriminate in sales of pre-made cakes, only in design because it's expression and free speech. He doesn't want to design a cake that has a message on it that he would fundamentally disagree with. And Smith also promised the same, like she wouldn't discriminate in who she would design a website for as long as it's not a wedding website site that fundamentally disagrees with the biblical view of what a wedding is. And so Lori Smith sought that injunction that would ensure that's what she feared and that's what she wanted to be assured would not happen. And unfortunately, as I looked at the Masterpiece Cake Shop website and there's a tab for wedding. And so when I go to that, there's a message that says Masterpiece Cake Shop is not currently accepting requests to create custom wedding cakes. Please check back in the future. So unfortunately, you know, he's forced not to be able to express himself on wedding cakes in any way. Like he has to discriminate against everyone in that case because his ability to do that is currently up in the air. This case, from the descending side, it kind of compels us to ask some important questions that maybe they would consider. Like, if we were going to take their reasoning, their logic, about making anti-discrimination rule and restrict the First Amendment and compel people to express, to design, to speak in a certain way, even against their beliefs, would a liberal website designer or cake designer want to be forced to design something for the Proud Boys or QAnon? (laughs) Would a liberal cake designer want to design a cake that's like infused in and out with celebrating Donald Trump, (laughs) whom they would probably consider the devil himself? If they wouldn't want to do it, then why would they expect Christians to have to make cakes celebrating things that they would consider oxymoron, like gay wedding? Would almost any website or cake designer want to design something with a swastika on it? Like, so we've got to think. And the liberals would just say, well, of course, that's not protected speech or that's not a protected group. Nazis are not a protected group. So that doesn't fall under anti-discrimination. Well, why are we allowed to discriminate against some people, but not others? What if Colorado, of course, looking into the future as the way things are going with identity politics, what if Colorado added minor attracted persons as a protected class? And then could a Christian then have to design something praising and celebrating minor attracted persons or eventually have to design a wedding cake celebrating the marriage between a 50-year-old and a 10-year-old? You know, just think about how, I remember from your, the CNN interview video talked about how politics change over time, but freedom of speech doesn't. The principle of it doesn't. The court didn't create new law. They just applied it in a cultural moment where some disagree with Lori's message. And it's important that we stick to protecting freedom because political and cultural winds shift. And so why should people be forced to have to express things related to the whims of lobbying groups that lobby the government to change definitions of laws and of groups and discrimination? 
as I was reading Sotomayor's dissent, it seems that ultimately the whole idea of religious views in their mind is that religious views are confined to religious institutions, not a Christian business. It's churches, synagogues, mosques, that type of thing. Like to them, religion is something that you can only confine to an association organized and legally recognized as an institution of worship within that religion that holds services to just kind of deal internally. But religious views cannot be combined merely to worship services in churches, synagogues, or mosques, and so on. A person of faith, to be a person of faith, must be able to live this faith in public and commerce and not feel like he or she has to be a hypocrite to do so. As we've been looking at these Supreme Court rulings, the Supreme Court gesturing, remember, the same exact three judges in the dissenting opinion in the first case we looked at, the affirmative action case, (laughs) Because we're talking about, oh, you can't discriminate in the products, the goods and services and the speech and the conduct that you offer here. But the same three liberal justices, they were strongly in favor of the necessity that universities can discriminate in admitting students for college based on their skin color. (laughs) that it was so important to them. I mean, like, these people need special consideration and that even, like, Asian Americans, they could work really hard and still not be able to be admitted because we need to make sure other people get in. Why is that kind of strong discrimination something we have to fight so hard to allow when it comes to college admissions? And I'm sure they would believe other things, too. But somehow when it comes to someone baking cakes or designing websites, they must be forced and compelled to say things they don't believe on the basis of not discriminating. Yeah, that's what you get when it comes to progressive politics. It's interesting when we talk about all this anti-discrimination or discrimination and just how when you think about it, the scripture is so clear on our freedom in Christ. And anti-discrimination laws actually force involuntary servitude. It's almost like enforcing slavery. (laughs) And you don't want to live in that. And that's not what Christ wants us to live by either, is in this constant position of being enslaved to government and their rules and their mandates and all these pet peeve things that come down on Christians specifically And it goes against what we believe in, in that if we don't stand up against us, then we're just going to be slaves to these people that want to tell us what we can say, how we can say it, and what we can do, where we can go. So it's so important to stand up for that freedom and protect that freedom. And I think it's very encouraging and um, so brave of this Miss Smith to go through the fire like this and to stand up for freedom when everyone else is trying to bash her or put her down. And I just think that, yeah, it's very courageous of her to do this. Good observation there, sweetheart. Yeah, it's definitely to compel for someone to have to offer a service like this that expresses then it takes labor to go design a site uh, websites and the guise of anti-discrimination that she should be forced to do this so some potential customer comes up and basically says well because i am who i am and you can't discriminate now you must be forced for this kind of transaction including you must labor to make what i want you to make and it doesn't matter that they're paying for it you can't use money to compel someone to perform work against their own judgment that is slavery the slaveholders they paid their slaves you know in giving them food and shelter yeah it was cruel chattel slavery is absolutely immoral and wrong that's not just compensation either and whipping them. Yeah, like you know, whether we get into all that, of course, but still, it doesn't matter if you offer money to someone, you can't force a transaction, you can't force labor 
that is slavery. I hope you enjoyed this series on Supreme Court gesturing and this particular episode talking about the ruling in 303 Creative versus Elanus. As Christians, when we think about what the world wants to impose on us, that we know it goes against what the Bible teaches. You know, we talked about freedom of speech and making people accommodate other things, but we also as Christians recognize what truth is. There is truth according to the Bible, and Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. So we realize when we're talking about so-called gay weddings and these protected groups that have to do with orientation and identity and stuff like that, we as Christians are not just saying, well, that's one group and Christians are another group and Jews and Muslims, it's all just different groups. You know, like that's not the case at all. There is truth, there is morality according to the Bible. And it says that God's wrath is revealed from heaven against ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness and the push from the world to force Christians to do things like this. This isn't just a case of someone discriminating against a group. It's a case of trying to make a Christian do something that is unrighteous. And so that's what we need to keep in mind. We're dealing with an unrighteous world that wants to force people to partake in their ways. And so we hope that this episode was a help to you and to think through these matters of freedom and truth from the Word of God. And stay tuned for the next episode of Truth Espresso. And God bless. Thank you for waking up with Truth Espresso. Good morning, and God bless your day. Hey friends, Daniel Minnick here again. If you liked waking up to this episode of Truth Espresso, I would really appreciate it if you would rate it on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or whatever application you use to listen to Truth Espresso.